And in fact, in our country today, Medicaid pays, I believe it's 43% of uh, our long-term care needs are paid for by Medicaid. So um, a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to, Harry, I'm not going to worry about Medicaid. I'm never going to be in a situation where I need it. But a lot of Americans today are turning to Medicaid yeah. to pay for their long-term care costs because they haven't put any money away, nor do they have private long-term care coverage, insurance coverage to provide for those needs. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another segment of Intentional Money Matters. My name is Caleb Williams. I'm here with Harry Stout. And on today's segment, we're going to be talking about health insurance. So don't freak out. This is going to be very, very informational podcast that's going to equip you with uh, all the ins and outs of everything you need to know about health insurance 101 and also the difference between medicare and medicaid so before we jump in is harry as as always you have uh, put together some really really powerful information that's going to be great for our listeners why don't you give us like a why don't we step back and let's look at like the landscape of of health insurance and make sure that we like understand first and foremost what is health insurance why do we have it maybe some stats before then we go into Medicare and Medicaid and and really how we can be um, strategic and how we use all this uh, to make sure that we're covered and making sure that we can show up powerfully today. Oh, absolutely. Thanks, Caleb. When you look at health insurance, obviously, that's one of the key financial risks that every household has is the risk that a health event is going to take place in that household and they're not going to have the cash necessary to, to pay for that cost. And in fact, as we know, the number one reason for bankruptcy in our country are unpaid medical bills. Yep. So uh, by the way, having lived abroad, I can tell you our health insurance is complex. It's, it's actually crazy in comparison to, uh, uh, you know, uh, different, all the major industrialized countries around the world. I think we're the only we're the only country that doesn't provide universal health care for all of its uh, citizens. And maybe we'll get there someday, but we have a reality that we deal with today. So when you look at it and you look at the health insurance space, about 50% of Americans get their health insurance through their employer. Fifty hmm. percent, and the reason for this, and this is a little little fact that people don't know about, but after World War II, the country experienced significant inflation, hmm. significant inflation, and companies were having to pay higher and higher rates for employees. So the government came along and put price controls in and wage controls in, and limited what you could pay someone for a job. And this is, you know, this is a topic that's, I think, <laughs> interesting today with uh, the seven, seven and a half percent inflation we're experiencing. But the government put wage and price controls in. So one of the ways that companies found a way around that was say, OK, we'll hire you for fifty thousand dollars a year. Hey, but we'll pay your health insurance. So we'll, we'll give you so it'll be fifty thousand dollars a year plus we'll pay your health insurance. And as it turned out, health insurance was not included in this, this, these controls that were put in place. So that's what's happened over the years. We have an employment situation. Most people get their health care through work versus through the government or through some sort of universal health pro program. Mm -hmm. So a little different, if you will, but that's how the U.S. has tied health insurance to working. And it's stayed and it's, 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 you know, just hasn't been able to be changed. A number of people have tried, but that's, the, that's a, just, a, I think, an interesting thing to understand about health insurance in our country. And so when you then add, you say 50% of the people are covered through work, about 20% get their coverage through Medicare, 20% get coverage through Medicaid, which we'll talk about in a second, about 10% of people pay for it direct. And that would be through one of the exchanges, for instance. And then there's a, a number of other programs, very small percentage that are benefits provided by the U.S. military, the Veterans Association that pay health benefits for people. So when you look at it, the biggest place that people get coverage today is through work. But uh, two, other, the, two other major programs are Medicaid and Medicaid. Medicaid and Medicare. And I, we ought to talk about those. And for those of you listening 
who are saying, look, I think I understand Medicare, bear with us. I think you may find it, you may learn a few things about that. And with Medicaid, you may not understand how it could impact your life later on. And, uh, and, and Caleb and I'll talk about that a little bit, because I think it's something you need to, you need to understand. Yeah. Un- unlike many other subjects, I don't have a ton to add with what you stated. I think it's, I think it's really eye-opening on some of the statistics that you, that you shared. Um, and one of the reasons why we're having this is I want to know more about Medicare and Medicaid and almost have a, like a segment that we can chop up that can give a really good summary. Um, because again, uh, you'd be shocked in the, the people that are supposed to know a lot about the financial planning world. Like they're not talking about this, especially when people are nearing retirement. And I come from this belief that, you know, we can't just make an investment decision and ignore everything else. Like everything is together and a more efficient decision eliminates friction, eliminates roadblocks to getting to where we want to go. And so we need to not just look at um, investing and, and cool efficiency strategies, but we also need to look at protection because every dollar needs to, to be doing as much as it can to help us get to where we want to go. And so I think health insurance um, is, is one of those things. And so I'm, I'm all ears, I'm taking notes, but... I, unfortunately, I don't have a ton to add to the subject. Well, well, let's let's build on that. First of all, you're right. Protection, having protection in place. And let's maybe talk about the differences between Medicare and Medicaid. I think people understand private health insurance offered through their employer. You and I could do several hours on that uh, through the world of plan selection, deductibles, co-insurance, health savings accounts. Those are Those are issues. But from a from a planning standpoint, when you're planning someone's financial life and, and helping them for their later years, Medicare and Medicaid are really important. And I, and I think you're right, Caleb, part of what is called holistic financial planning is you have to take those into consideration. And so if, as we look at these, remember, Medicare is the government program that was put in place to provide health insurance for the elderly. For folks that are over age 65, you have to sign up for Medicare. Again, it is not easy. It has different parts to it. There's original Medicare referred to as Part A. We have Medicare Part B, which is relating to paying for the cost of doctors. Then we have Part D that relates to uh, paying for prescriptions. And then we have something called Part C, which is the Medicare Advantage Plan, which is another way of providing coverage to individuals for both uh, for help for the hospital part, the doctor part, and the prescription part. But the plan, Medicare is, is designed to provide for the elderly. So uh, 65 and above, you're part of the plan. Now, in our country today, there are a lot of conversations that have been going on. Let's extend Medicare from age 65. Let's bring it down to age 60. Let's make it maybe Medicare for all. That would be universal health coverage, and our country hasn't been willing to, uh, to get to that point. But Medicare, again, is focused on that, elder, that elderly uh, population. Now, when you look at it and you spend time analyzing it, when you turn age 65, Caleb, when you get to that, that uh, part of your life there, you'll, basic Medicare is provided to you at no cost. And the reason is over the years, you've made payroll contributions into the funds to help pay for that. But um, starting at age 65, the government provides you with base hospital coverage through Medicare. Now, it, then it doesn't pay for all of your doctor bills. It doesn't pay for all of your prescriptions. So people typically have to get private insurance to to pay for those gaps. You'll hear Medigap coverage or Medigap policies to to pay for those costs that Medicare doesn't cover. Is that, are people also call that like supplement plans? Yeah, Medicare Medicare? supplement, Medigap policies, yes. Different names in different states for, for different ways. But that's what you're basically doing. So you have to fund that. You have to take that money out of your pocket and pay for that. And And overall, if you look at someone retiring in 2021, that's the latest statistic available, husband and wife looking to need about 300,000 after tax to pay for their health costs in retirement, 300,000. And that takes into, that doesn't include, you know, you don't have to pay anything out of pocket for base Medicare, but you do have to pay money for your doctor bills that aren't covered by Medicare. And how do you protect yourself? Well, you buy a Medicare supplement or a Medigap policy to pay those costs, but that costs you money also. And uh, will cost you money as you age. 
Now, you can buy these coverages. That market is fully regulated. The government has um, totally re-regulated how those products are sold, disclosed, and how you pay for them. The interesting thing is in the last several years, the government has put in means testing for a lot of those insurance. So if you hit certain income thresholds, you have to pay more for your Medicare, excuse me, your, your Part B coverage. You have to pay more for that. You have to pay more for your drugs if you make more money. And they're trying to do that to, to make the Medicare program more financially secure and stable. But that's what Medicare does. Oh, and by the way, unfortunately, Medicare doesn't cover dental. It doesn't cover vision and it doesn't cover hearing aids, which sounds kind of, I know if you, if you, if we were designing a system today, provide for the elderly, you think you'd allow them to go to the dentist, make sure they could hear and, uh, and make sure their vision was good, but those are not covered under core Medicare. So you got to pay for those yourself. Sometimes the Medicare supplement plans pay for them. Other times they don't. And so you need to be able to get those coverages, but that's a summary of what, how Medicare fits. But again, you're going to have expenses as you age, and you're yeah. going to have to pay for those. Oh, and then one, the biggest item, and, I, and I'm sorry for not mentioning this first off, the biggest item that Medicare does not pay for is long-term care. So, you know, here we are, most people, you know, if you look at it today, uh, the industry statistics indicate that there's like a 70% chance of someone who's age 65 needing some sort of long-term care coverage for a two to four year period in their lives, a 70% probability, but Medicare doesn't cover that. So uh, that's going to be, you, you have to protect yourself against that and provide for that. So, so before we compare it to Medicaid, yeah, let me just do a recap. So Medicare, it, you can qualify for it when you're over 65. Yep, you do. Yep. There, if you're, if you make a lot of money, does that prohibit you to, to get or does that bring up the cost at all for Medicare? No, no. Everyone gets every, okay. everyone gets the same base benefit. Uh, um, and then it covers some things, but other things like dental and um, uh, vision aids and kind of deal. Yep. Um, and so there's supplemental plans that you would have to pay out of pocket. Yeah, you you pay for those either you get insurance or you may have to pay actual cash out of pocket for those expenses not covered by insurance. Okay. Um, and so, but then the big thing that it does not cover is, is long-term care. That is correct. And so, so, okay. I feel like I have a, a understanding of this. What is the difference between Medicare and Medicaid? Because, um, personally, I wouldn't be able to do a presentation breaking down the difference off the top of my head. Yeah. And here's a, here's an easy way to look at it, Caleb. Medicaid is for all ages. It's not just for over 65s, it's for all ages. And Medicaid is, depending on the type of coverage, it's income-based and asset-based. And it's intended to provide health insurance for those individuals in the lower income and lower asset households. And Medicaid, by the way, provides coverage for most all aspects of health insurance, including, excuse me, all aspects of your medical needs, including long-term care. And in fact, in our country today, Medicaid pays, I believe it's 43% of uh, our long-term care needs are paid for by Medicaid. So um, a lot of people say, well, I'm not going to, Harry, I'm not going to worry about Medicaid. I'm never going to be in a situation where I need it. But a lot of Americans today are turning to Medicaid yeah. to pay for their long-term care costs because they haven't put any money away, nor do they have private long-term care coverage, insurance coverage to provide for those needs. And, and is it fair to say that Medicaid is the ultimate um, safety net? And, and so it's one of those things where you can't cheat the system, meaning like if you have assets, of like if you have millions of dollars stacked away somewhere, but have a zero income, before you qualify for Medicaid, you need to spend down your own money. Is that it? Or, or if you're having what I mean, the worst case scenario is if you have like a huge income, no assets, but that income is like going to alimony and other things. Do you, do you get caught in a situation where it's like, I, I can't afford, even though I'm making good money, I can't afford health insurance? How, how does that play a role? And am I correct where I say like, it is ultimately the, the safety net that 
means that you are have no assets or very little assets and you have very little income? Yes, I, I would say that. And what you, but the, I wish there was an easy answer to this. Medicaid, and it goes back to how it's funded. Medicaid is funded by the federal government and the states. The states have, a, each state has a budget for what it spends on their health, health care for the indigent. The federal government matches it to a certain extent, but it's a combined state and federal program. Medicare, by the way, is all federal, but Medicaid, Medicaid is federal and state. And Caleb, the qualifications state by state are very, very complex and very difficult in terms of what income level, if you're a, if you're a single person, if you're a family, if you're a family with two children, um, Got it. An example is to qualify for nursing home coverage in certain states, uh, what assets you have, what, what assets do you currently have? And you may not, you may have too much in assets to qualify for uh, nursing home, uh, for, for a long-term care protection or nursing home protection. And by the way, the states are smart. Uh, if, say you had $2 million and you decided to sneak and give it to your kids four years before you go into the nursing home. There's something called a look back period, state by state. And many of the states go back five years at least. And they'll say, wait a minute, what happened to the $2 million you had uh, four years ago? Where, where's that? And we want to take that money. And by the way, uh, example, other things that states are having to do because they need the money. If they're saying if your children are less than age 50, we're going to bill them for your care. Yeah. Because you should be supporting your parents. Yeah. So several states are looking at ways to recover money in that way. Yeah. So what we see here, and, and so if, as you look at Medicaid, then that's coverage. It's meant for families, take care of people without money and without, uh, without assets and without income. And what I find tragic about it, in my view, is I looked at some states and the amount of income as an individual that you, you have to be, uh, one state I looked at was, I think, for a single person, you had to make less than $12,000 a year to cover to, to, to qualify for, Medi for Medicaid. Mm. Caleb, who's, who's, who's going to live on who can live yeah. anywhere today? Yeah. And, and, and some, of yeah. these, some of these numbers just haven't been looked at in years. Yeah. Uh, I'll give you one other example. To qualify for Medicaid for nursing home coverage or long-term care coverage, most of the states say you can't have more than 2,000 in assets, 2,000 yeah. in liquid assets. It's like it, I mean, that's, you, you have free health insurance, but you, that's, that's that's uh, there's a lot of other problems with that scenario, you know. Yeah, but th but think about yeah. this. So we we've made it very complex. Yeah. But that's and it's again a state by state issue. So what is the? I'm I'm a big fan of like, what do, what do we do from here from a standpoint of like knowing what we know. Obviously, anyone listening to this, um, the goal should be to not have to rely on Medicaid. I don't care what state you're in. It's it's probably not a great it's not a great strategy. We live in the United States, so. Um, you know, we're not going to let people just be on the streets, but overall it's not a intentional living scenario that necessarily I, I want my community to be a part of. Um, it sounds like med Medicare is, is one of those, uh, no brainers when you get past 65, but it, it could change you there, who knows as it relates to income requirements. And so it's just knowing that that's on the horizon. What is the call to action for, for you? And do you have anyone that you would recommend learning more or, or referring to if, if someone's, you know, watching this or listening to this saying, Hey, I, I want to, I want to make sure I'm, I can hack the system and make sure that I'm not only just taken care of, but I'm not, I'm also paying the most efficient premium for making sure that I'm going to be okay. Yeah. Here's what I would say, Caleb, you, you have to have a financial plan. I, my, my, you have to have a plan in place at around age 50, that plan needs to, to start to take into consideration planning for health care costs when you stop working full time. Starting at age 50, there, there may be certain decisions you have to start to think about. Uh, when will you claim Social Security? When will you not claim Social Security? Uh, what, what's the health of our family? What's the health of you and your partner? Are you, are you fine? Or are you struggling? Are you going to anticipate higher costs? What's your family history? I mean, uh, Example in my family, my mom lived to be 90, my grandmother lived to be 90, my great grandmother lived to be 92. I've, I've got the genes of my mother's part of the family. And, um, uh, and so that I know that I, I, I just that's who I am and, 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 uh, and, and what's there. So 
I think overall financial plan, sitting down and making sure that you plan for health care, you've got proper health care coverages in place. Uh, also, using a health savings account is a great technique today. Yeah, totally. You know, for, you know, I think it's thirty six hundred for a single, seventy two hundred for a family. Put that money away. That's triple tax free dollars. That's a planning technique. But I think working with a financial professional who can help you lay that out. But it's a key element of of, of planning for your later years and planning for your retirement is you've got to have the healthcare dollars there to take care of things. And uh, it'll determine what's in your emergency fund, what your deductibles are. That's the key. So I think planning for it is essential. If you don't, I think you're putting the quality of your later years at risk. Yep. I know in our strategic you know, family office like network, we have someone that covers health insurance. And it's one of those things where we recommend everyone that's a part of that to go talk to this person because it's like, I don't care what scenario you have, it's always good to get a second opinion. It's always good to look at the different options. Um, I know that there's, you know, you know, MediShare sharing plans out there. I know that there's hybrid plans out there. And it's one of those things that I'll definitely have a segment talking about the pros and cons of, of each approach um, because I definitely think awareness needs to be um, the key. And a lot of people, um, myself included, I, health insurance is not their favorite topic to talk about oh. when it comes to yeah, wealth building. It, it, oh, I, and I'm not going to say we all know people, but I feel like we all recall a person that, I mean, they're, they're seems like their whole life is paying off medical bills because they um, didn't take the time to, or, or put into a situation where they didn't have the ability to have life insurance or health insurance. And so overall, I, I appreciate you breaking this down and, um, we'll definitely have some more information in the show notes. And obviously, uh, I would love for you to plug what you're up to. And and I don't know if you have any final thoughts, but I appreciate you putting the time into this. Oh, no problem. One last thing, Caleb, and I think I see this more and more today, and I just want to highlight it for people. We have friends with autistic children and uh, and providing for the, the needs of those special, those children on a long-term basis, their health insurance needs is so important. And under certain circumstances, they can qualify for Medicare at younger ages. They don't have to be age 65. There are some provisions that relate to them. So I think it's real important for those in your audience who may have a special needs child to take some time to look into some of these things. And so many of these folks are on top of things and they do, they're looking out after their children who have these issues. But I think I just wanted to highlight that because I think that's very meaningful and very important. It doesn't apply, obviously, to the vast majority of people, but planning for that from a number of standpoints, not only the health insurance protection, but the life insurance side provide money for later coverage is so important. So that's the only item I'd like to add. But again, awareness is key here. If you're aware and you say, wait a minute, I need to find out more and I need to talk to someone who can help me. That's really what we're trying to do today. And you can't live intentionally without health insurance and health cover. Um, if you're watching on YouTube and you have a, a health insurance hack, I would love to hear from you. You can also email me at info at betterwealth.com or Caleb at betterwealth.com. I would love to hear your thoughts um, as we're, 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 we're trying to be more strategic as a company and, and give uh, the people in our community uh, multiple options. Harry, what's the best way to follow you and what you're up to in the world? Absolutely. You can follow us. Uh, I'm on Facebook under F Financial Verse, my website at Financial Verse. If you go to our website, follow us in particular, follow the press tab. Uh, uh, I write for a number of the uh, publications, national publications. You can follow my latest hallucinations by uh, going to the press tab there. And, uh, and, my, and also the Financial Verse podcast, where again, we try to deal with in these matters that allow you to live a, a better, less, stressful and, and less anxious financial life. I love it. I appreciate you taking time with us today. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to reading the comments and hearing what people's thoughts are of this episode. All right. Thanks, Caleb.